The Old Testament reading for the 24th Sunday after Trinity is from Isaiah chapter 51. Awake, awake, put on strength, O arm of the Lord, awake, as in days of old, the generations of long ago. Was it not you who cut Rahab in pieces that pierced the dragon? Was it not you who dried up the sea, the waters of the great deep, who made the depths of the sea a way for the redeemed to pass over? And the ransom to the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain gladness and joy and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. I, I am he who comforts you. Who are you that you are afraid of man who dies, of the son of man who is made like grass, and have forgotten the Lord your maker, who stretched out the heavens and laid the foundations of the earth, and you fear continually all the day because of the wrath of the oppressor when he sets himself to destroy. And where is the wrath of the oppressor? He who is bowed down shall speedily be released. He shall not die and go down to the pit. Neither shall his bread be lacking. I am the Lord your God who stirs up the sea so that its waves roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. And I have put my words in your mouth and covered you in the shadow of my hand establishing the heavens and laying the foundation of the earth and saying to Zion, you are my people. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. You have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. I love the Lord because The epistle is from Colossians chapter 1. And so, from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. May you be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please rise for the reading of the Holy Gospel. According to St. Matthew, the ninth chapter. Glory be to thee, o Lord. While Jesus was saying these things to them, behold, a ruler came in and knelt before him, saying, My daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her, and she will live. And Jesus rose and followed him with his disciples, and behold, A woman who had suffered from a discharge of blood for 12 years came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment. For she said to herself, If I only touch his garment, I will be made well. Jesus turned, and seeing her, he said, Take heart, daughter, your faith has made you well. And instantly the woman was made well. And when Jesus came to the ruler's house, 
he saw the flute players and the crowd making a commotion. He said, go away, for the girl is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But when the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took her by the hand, and the girl arose. And the report of this went through all that district. This is the Gospel of the Lord. In the name of Jesus, amen. How are you going to be remembered when you're gone from this world? Will you be one of those people that it's said at the visitation and at the funeral luncheon that he never complained? She was a friend to everyone. And they never said an unkind thing. But after the funeral and the luncheon, and after a little time has passed, what are people going to remember about you? They might know your name and your birthday and the day you died. But what else will be known about you in the year 2123? Well, what do you know about your ancestors from 1923? Probably not much. What about 1823? Probably even less, if anything. So who's going to remember me in a hundred years? Well, my picture might still be hanging on that wall in the hallway amongst all the other pastors that have served this congregation. But it could just as easily be boxed up and put away in a closet somewhere, only for someone in a hundred years to come across it and go, why are we hanging on to these? And they get tossed out. And even if you say that it doesn't really matter to you, we all want to be remembered in some way. But we know that eventually our names are going to be forgotten. The memories of me are eventually going to fade into obscurity. And it begs the question for you and I to consider, because everyone in this room has suffered and are suffering the death of a loved one. Grandma or grandpa, husband or wife, mother or father, child or friend. What do you do with that deep felt grief? Well, you can bottle it up and you can hold it back, but we really should know better because it's not healthy to do it. It can all cause all sort of other issues for our mental health and even our physical health. You can dwell on it and let, you consume, let it consume you, like Queen Victoria of England. When her husband, Prince Albert, died in 1861, the queen entered a period of mourning that lasted almost 40 years until her own death in 1901. Think about that. Nearly 40 years of mourning, of dressing in black. After Albert's death, Queen Victoria secluded herself for a number of years until she was finally forced to appear in public. But she never stopped mourning Albert's death. And you've probably heard of Prince Albert and Queen Victoria, even if you're not at all interested in British history. But you do know George Washington. You do know Martin Luther King Jr. But who knows you? Who's going to remember you? Even Albert, Victoria, George, and Martin will eventually be forgotten. Death has a way of erasing memories. And maybe that's one of the most terrifying things about death. 
how easily and quickly we forget. Jairus' daughter dies. And Jairus is stricken with grief. And who wouldn't be? What cold, darkened heart isn't grief-ridden over the death of a child? And so Jairus comes to Jesus and kneels before him and says, My daughter has just died. Well, of course it's terrible. But why is he telling this to Jesus? Is he looking for sympathy? Or just condolences? No, Jairus goes to the one that can, that can go in. He goes to the only one that he can go to in his grief. My daughter has just died. But come and lay your hand on her and she will live. As far as we can tell, Jairus had never met Jesus before. We're not told if Jairus had heard Jesus preaching or how he even came to know about Jesus. But regardless, that's where Jairus goes. There's no questions asked of Jairus, but simply Jesus rose and followed him with his disciples. When Prince Albert died, Queen Victoria's grief consumed her, and her sorrow launched a new idea of how to deal with mourning. All over England, funeral providers found unprecedented wealth from the sale of mourning dresses, mourning suits, black armbands, and other such items. The queen's grief literally spawned an entire market that didn't exist before. That event in the 19th century was more than a little excessive, unless you're the one who's directly facing the death of a loved one. But we in the 21st century, we have tried to sanitize death. We've shoved death away out of daily life as much as possible because we don't want to be reminded of our own mortality. We don't want to be reminded of death, especially of those we love, especially the death of children. Look at the outcry that's coming out of the Middle East in the last few weeks when a hospital is targeted or a school or a daycare. Have you seen the videos and heard the cries of the Mothers and fathers weeping over their children who have been raped and beaten to death? Have you heard the cries of the husband who mourns over what happened to his dead wife? We can try and sanitize death all we want. We can try and hide it away in the basement of a funeral home all we want. But death is a reminder of our own mortality and that eventually nobody's going to remember us. And we know from Scripture that death is the result of sin and our corrupted and selfish nature. We also know that death is the final enemy to be overcome. Despite all of our efforts to keep death at bay through the wonders of medicine, of good health, and better nutrition, we even claim that we can extend life to have longer lifespans. But despite all of our efforts, death always seems to catch us unaware. But there is one who knows you. There is one who remembers you. There is one who will never forget you the one who comes to you and feeds you, serves, cares, and strengthens you, 
the one who gives you courage. For at the altar you kneel like Jairus in his holy presence. Pastor Eric Schink, a professor at the Concordia Senior College in Fort Wayne, wrote, let us go to the table of the Lord as if we were going to meet death, so that one day we may go to meet death as if we were going to the table of the Lord. For around the altar, with holy voices raised in praise of God, declaring the wonders of his salvation, Angels and archangels join in singing with, to the one who was slain, who is now risen from the dead, and as, who is now present on the altar. He is the one who swallowed up death by death, and he is your champion. He went in and took her by the hand, and the girl arose. She slept the sleep of death, and Jesus awakened her more easily than she awakened herself from sleep in the morning. That's the power of your God. That's the love and the strength that is within him who took on flesh in the womb of the virgin. Jesus doesn't come and give you empty platitudes and shallow condolences, but he comes to give you life and life in abundance. For Jesus lays down his life on the cross and takes it back up on the third day. And he remembers you. He knows you. For he comes to you here each Lord's day at pulpit and altar, and you kneel before him at the rail. And there he feeds you with the medicine of immortality. So come and kneel in his holy presence. Kneel with all of your sorrow and your grief. Kneel with all of your shame and your guilt. Kneel with all of your uncertainties and your yearnings. And the thundering voice of eternity sounds forth. Your sin is forgiven. And you realize that you're not alone. You're not forgotten. But you join with the angels and the archangels in singing, Holy, 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 Lord God of Sabaoth. You join with the multitude of the saints that no one can number. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. Kneel in his holy presence and receive the forgiveness of sins and eternal life, the life that springs forth from the grave, life that death cannot overcome, life that is yours even now, life that belongs to those who have died in the faith, for they too live, even while their bodies rest in the grave. All of your loved ones, those that you know and those that you don't know, all of your ancestors that have died in the faith, they will live. And that's not an empty hope. That's not an empty platitude. It's not sympathy. But it's a sure and certain hope for Jesus is the firstborn from the dead. And if there is a firstborn, that implies that there will be more to come. And while we here below must grieve our dead, we grieve in hope. And Jesus puts away our sorrows. And you can be sure that Jesus remembers you. And he will raise you up on the last day. So whatever your legacy might be, it's not really your legacy. It's Jesus. Kneel before him in his holy presence 
as he comes to you today. In the name of Jesus. Amen. The peace of God which surpasses understanding guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.